So our objective is to get to the basic formula from which all asset pricing follows, P equals E of MX. What does all this stuff mean? Any formula, the way you get to it is first understand the players and how it works, and then do the derivation. So let's understand what X is. X is a way of encompassing the payoff, uh, that's the name of it, payoff of any asset. So for example, if I have a stock, I pay a price P for it, and what I get tomorrow, the payoff, is tomorrow's price plus tomorrow's dividends. If I buy it for a price P, that's the amount of money I could sell it for tomorrow and be done. If I buy a bond, I could pay a price P, which might be like 98 cents, and get a dollar for sure. Or I can invest a dollar and get the risk-free rate. Uh, that might be 1.03. So bonds also have a payoff, just like stocks. The prices can be zero. A classic example is a, is a bet. If, I bet, uh, if, you, if you bet against your buddies on the next uh, football game, you put down zero money today and either gain a dollar or lose a dollar uh, according to whether your team wins or loses. All of those can be encompassed into price today and payoff tomorrow. The payoff is random. You don't know what's going to happen. It's a random variable. So the way to think about random variables is there's multiple states of nature, which will denote S, each of which has a probability associated with it. And here's the list of the things that could come out. I just did a simple example. The payoff could be 3, 1.5, 0, or minus 5 with associated probabilities. Of course, we will usually think of probabilities as being continuous. We'll draw something like a distribution of possible values for x along with a probability distribution. But you need to keep in mind that x is potentially a random variable. So we have random payoffs. Now the big question, what's it worth? Once we understand the possibilities for the payoff, what is the investor willing to pay to get that random payoff? Now, there is nothing written in stone about asset pricing. Asset pricing is modeling human behavior. We need to write down a simplified model of how people feel about stuff. There's no way of avoiding psychology. Uh, Martians might feel about stuff differently than people feel about stuff. And that's the point of the utility function. The utility function is a way of, in a very simple, consistent way, capturing the evident fact that people prefer money now and people prefer money that isn't so risky. And so what we need is a, a mathematical structure to help us capture those features of human psychology. And that's what the utility function does. It answers the question, value to who? So the way we write down the utility function the utility is defined over consumption today and consumption tomorrow, CT and CT plus 1. And the form that we'll use almost to start with, we can do fancier utility functions. Today we're doing the very simple version to understand how everything works. It'll be the utility of consumption today plus beta, a discount factor. That's a number typically on the order of 0.95 at an annual basis, just a number, times the expected utility of consumption tomorrow. Now, what does the internal utility function look like? We, we want to capture the fact that people like to eat more, but once you've had your third pizza, the next slice of pizza doesn't feel quite so good as the last ones. So the utility function maps consumption into happiness, and it rises, saying more is always better, but it rises at a declining rate, saying once you've had a lot, extra consumption isn't that valuable to you. So. <clears throat> A typical functional form that we'll use, we have to work out problems. We have to be able to, to, to create little artificial economies and see how they price assets. A typical functional form we'll use, because it's very convenient, is this power function. C to the, C to the 1 minus gamma. I've, you can see that the 1 minus gamma over here is there so that marginal utility is simple. Marginal utility, which is what's going to show up in all our formulas, is just a power function. Or as gamma goes to 1, the simplest and clearest of all, the log utility function. That's a function that looks just like this. As consumption goes up, the uh, log utility function goes up, but at a declining rate. As consumption goes down to 0, people get really, really hungry. And in fact, the marginal utility is the most important part of asset pricing. What matters for asset pricing is not so much the level of utility, but the marginal utility, how hungry people are, Marginal utility, the slope of the utility function, declines. 
That's how much, how much a little extra consumption would make you happier, and it rises as uh, consumption goes down towards zero. So that's our utility function. Now, what does, the, um, what does the concavity of the utility function buy us? Let me remind you of the classic illustration of risk aversion. So here's a concave utility function. I've mapped in the blue line how our, our investor might feel about a little bit of consumption C bar. If you've got consumption C bar, you look up at the utility function, and that tells you how happy that consumer is about consuming C bar. So that's a measure of the consumer's happiness. There's a little smiley face. Now let's ask that consumer, how do you feel about taking a bet where you might gain delta or lose delta? So his two opportunities are either gain or lose the same amount with equal probability. Let's bet on that football game. Well, if you gain, here's the new utility, and there's the new utility. If you lose, there's the new utility over here. And you can see that because the utility function is concave, therefore the expected utility is less than the utility of the original value. This consumer is made less well off, his utility goes down if he's forced to take a bet. Fundamentally, why is that? That is because people dislike losses more than they value gains. We're capturing that feature of human psychology that people feel losses more acutely than they like gains, which is related to the same idea that after you've had a whole lot, an extra doesn't help a lot. Once you, once you have very little, people who have very little are hungrier. So now we've got a gorgeous mathematical form that lets us separate the two crucial items we're looking at. The discount factor tells us how much people dislike delay. If we raise that number from 0.95 to a higher number, we say that, look, stuff that happens in the future is less valuable. As we raise the curvature of the utility function, as we make this gamma number larger, the gamma number larger makes the utility function more curved, that's going to make people more risk averse. So we have a simple mathematical formalism that lets us say, what's the value of the payoff to who? To someone who likes things now, measured by beta, and to someone who is averse to risks, measured by curvature of the utility function, or gamma, in this simple functional form, which we will, of course, generalize as things go on. So now, step three. Our objective is to understand price equals expected discounted payoff. We've discussed what a payoff is, a random payoff. We've discussed to whom, who is going to assess that value, uh, somebody with this utility function. So now let's ask somebody with that utility function, how much value do they give to a payoff? And that's so easy we can do it in three lines. We want to ask our investor, look, do a maximization problem. Choose, uh, start at your initial consumption, pay some today, lose the price today of the security, but in exchange, you get a little bit more of the payoff tomorrow. Tell us, go invest optimally. Go buy securities until the marginal cost of losing that consumption today equals the marginal benefit of eating the payoff tomorrow. So you know how to take that derivative, and the first order condition is right here. Price times marginal utility of consumption equals beta times expected marginal utility of tomorrow's payoff, or simply rearranging, we put the, uh, we put the u prime of c down on the bottom. We can now say that today's price is the expected discounted by marginal utility payoff tomorrow. In the, quad, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, power utility case, that looks like consumption growth to the minus gamma power. That is the form of the discount factor for that simple utility function. So look what we've done. In a few minutes flat, we have derived the basic formula of asset pricing. We know how to say, given a payoff, given an investor with discount factor beta and risk aversion gamma, looking at that investor's consumption, we know how much that investor values the asset. Now, some words of intuition. This is, of course, a very subtle formula, and we'll spend a lot of time thinking about exactly how it works. This comes after investment. This characterizes how the consumer or investor feels about value after he's done all the investment sigma that he can. So it's not about how do you value things before you get to invest. The chicken and the egg question from this perspective is, 
the investor looks at the payoffs and looks at the prices, and then the investor adjusts his consumption until his consumption lines up with the payoffs and the prices. We'll think about equilibrium a little more in the, in the future, but that is the thing that adjusts right now until price equals expected discounted payoff after the investor has done all his investment. If the, price, if, if the investor looks at this equation and the price looks too low, the investor buys a bunch of it. But when the investor buys a bunch of it, then it's going to lower today's consumption. It's going to raise future consumption until that comes back in line. Second, this is all about marginal investments. At the end, the investor's thinking about, let's just put one more dollar in and one more dollar out. If you have to invest in a big amount, you're told, oh, you can put 10 million in some venture capital deal or zero, that formula doesn't hold and we have to think about things more generally. Let's think about what it's saying, the, the big intuition of the formula. It shouldn't look that surprising in the end for the question we set up. We wanted to know, given a random payoff, what's its value today? You might have guessed, well, given a random payoff, the value today is just the expected value of the payoff. But then that's not quite right because the payoff's risky and it comes tomorrow. So you might say, and people did, well, let's take today's value is the expected value of the payoff, but we'll discount it. We'll say expected value of the payoff, but we'll, we'll take an expected return in, then one over the expected return might be a number like 0.9. So tomorrow's expected payoff is discounted to today's price. Well, that's not really quite right either. What our formula does is it puts in the M, which is random. We don't know what consumption is going to be tomorrow, but it acts like a discount factor. And that's why we call it the stochastic discount factor. It works in the same way. It's a natural generalization. It makes these ideas more precise. It tells you take the random payoffs, multiply each one by this discount factor, and add them up. And that is the correct way to think about the value of this payoff to that investor. To be super clear about it, how might you do it? You might take my example payoffs, 3, 1.5, 0, and minus 0.5, each with an associated probability. You don't just take the average. The right answer is you multiply the probabilities times the discount factor, times the marginal utility ratio, and then add them up, and that gives you the value today. Our next job is to take this basic formula really deeply understand it, and then see how it gets re-expressed in all the classic ideas of the theory of finance.